Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where we talk about TV shows of the supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about Season 1, Episode 7 of The Imperfects. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. So, as they're dealing with a new monster and plenty of other complications end up coming up. First and foremost, this monster has a neurotoxin ability where it can poison you and end up killing you or basically tra trap you in a never-ending nightmare type of situation. And at the same time this is all happening, Hannah's kind of coming to grips with her circumstances because it's like, yeah, cool, cool. I have this gunshot wound that I will forever feel this pain for. It's like, right, um, Abby wanted to protect someone she cared about, save them. It's like, right, your life was cut short, and it wasn't your fault. You know, you were kind of dragged into this, and so it's kind of on Isabel for kind of dragging her into this all in the first place, but I think Abby kind of feels like, right, I'm the one that kind of kept coming back to you for help with the whole Sarkov thing, and you know what happened to you, and it's like, right. But also, like, Abby came to care for her, so... And it's also the whole thing of dropping the bomb of like, plus you kind of got the whole immortality thing. It's like, wait, what do you mean immortality? It's like, oh, I thought you understood what it meant when we had this conversation. Because for Hannah, it's like, I've, she's like, I've always known I had a time limit. I always knew I was 40, going to have, uh, be 40 when I die. And at the very least, when you become content with death, knowing you have that timetable, like it makes you go like, right, you accept life, whatever time you have, it's a gift, you kind of appreciate it for what it is, you just accept your fate being what it is, and now it's like, right, not only did you like come back from the dead, now it's like, you won't die, you're immortal now, so it's like, oh cool, 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 and once again, it's the shittiest form of immortality because any wounds you sustain will forever be there. You will forever have to deal with them and that pain will never go away. So it's like every time you die and come back, whatever killed you is going to stick with you for the rest of your never-ending life. So it's like it is the worst form of torture of immortality. I've never really seen immortality. I mean, I guess like the closer you could get to that would be like vampirism, the need for blood, that hunger. But this is a different thing. This is like just constant pain. So it's a little bit of a different situation. So Hannah's got to deal with that. Abby wants to give her her space, but they're also trying to track down this monster. But it's like, okay, so the question is like, is this another uh, Chucky uh, situation? Um, Chupi situation. And lo and behold, they find Darcy at the crime scene because she wanted. To, well, she apparently was tracking um, Juan's phone. It's like, well, that kind of seems a little stalkerish. But it's like, well, he has ghosted you after everything that went down. So, but he talks to her about like how he wants to kill Chucky. It's like, right, you want to kill a a part of yourself, but he's like, it's not me. It's a monster. It's like. But that monster does come out when he wants to protect the people he cares about. So there is, a, you know, and there, may, there might be some similarities pretty much between... Because, once again, it's like, the last episode was all about how Juan and Sydney's circumstances are different. That is like, he's driven by animal instinct, uh, whereas Isabel is driven by being the other side of uh, Sydney's subconscious. So, or just her subconscious in general. So... But I think there's still a little parallel of the part of him that wants to strength and need to protect the people. Like that, that is still somewhere inside of him. I am curious, uh, will we eventually get to the point that, you know, he treats it as like a completely separate thing. Darcy's like, no, it's a part of you. It is you. She's like, the whole like chupy thing isn't because like I'm, I'm in love with beasts. It's not, my art isn't like fetishizing, fetishizing that. It's just because I know it's a part of you. You're just unwilling to see that. But he sees it as like, oh, you got your like, you've got your animal, your beast fetish. But then she gets attacked by the, um, the creature. And, uh, I love that like, just like transition of like, right, he jumps in front to fight the creature. It stabs him, hard cut to him, like waking up, screaming in pain. And Sarkov being like, oh, are you okay? He's like, no, no, I don't care about the emotional damage. I mean, physical. He's like, I'm fine. He's like, you should be thanking me. Because of uh, the stem cells inside of him, they prevented the neurotoxins from killing him. The other people were normal humans. Sarkov specific... Um, 
his specific um, stem cells ended up manifesting kind of like a resistance to the neurotoxin. It still will affect you like it did Juan, but it won't like kill you. It's the only thing keeping them alive. And Juan is actually kind of sad. He was like, yeah, I saw the devil. The devil had my mom and my dad in a cage and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. I was like, that's horrendous. But once I got in Sarkov's like, yeah, but other than that, like, okay, sure, whatever, your trauma, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, like, you should be thanking me. It's like, because of me, you're alive. He's like, thank you, I guess. And it's sad that, you know, and it's just like I would brought up before. I was like, oh, like, maybe Darcy and um, Juan would get back together, or maybe PJ and Tilda. And it's like, well, they kind of hooked back up, too, despite PJ being like, oh, where were you? Is this Dr. Yours real? Oh, this person, oh, drawing sketches. Like, yeah, but Juan, he's just a friend. Yeah, he has a crush on me, but that's about it. It's like... That's it, it flip flops so much because I think she is just trying to make it seem like, oh, it's just a crush. But it's like there's some part of you that does like him, too. But I don't think she wants to quite admit it. She's kind of like, but like, yeah, he's a kid that has a crush on me. But because she tries to, you know, but once again, she doesn't say that because she made a point saying like, oh, I'm not going to bring up you being younger than me anymore. I'm not going to like bring up your age as kind of an issue anymore. So. But it's like, right, for her, it's like, I'm about to get fixed, which they were all excited about. I love it. It's like, who's going to get fixed? We're going to get fixed. Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't be too excited about that. You mean what? Not killing people anymore? Because Abby also has a position of she's not the one that has, she doesn't constantly use her power. She's like, I use my fair muscle. They're like, yeah, reluctantly. Tilda uses her power all the time. Kind of doesn't have much choice. It's kind of active all the time. For a while, one couldn't control his, but now it's like he kind of has to leap into action sometimes. But with um, speaking of uh, Abby, we are furthering her abilities even more. It's kind of what I thought. Like obviously, with the introduction of her anger pheromones, it's yeah, like I said last episode. She's more like a succubus slash empath now. She can impart her feelings on people because she uh, now it is blue representing fear is what she instilled in that uh, cop at the hospital. I would think you would. I get it. You probably didn't want to take the chance. You might affect anyone else that walked in a room or the victim when you were trying to get samples from her wound. But it's like, yeah, you probably shouldn't have like nullified the pheromones until you were like completely out of the place. So, but, and also showcases, she can shift them at any time because she went from fear to, to her lust pheromones. Now the question then becomes like, well, what other pheromones will she be able to give out? Like, will she be able to give out like a green as in like jealousy or greed type of situation? Um, are those red, uh, yellow and green the only, uh, red, blue and yellow the only like main ones? I, I, I'm, it'd be interesting to see what else she can do. Um, but either way, uh, the moment Toto was breaking down like that, um, and like her phone was in her hand, I was like, it's PJ, isn't it? It's like, right. Because we saw that the creature was following them, and they pretty much end up figuring out it's Nate. It's like, uh, because uh, looking at the samples, um, Abby was able to trace them not back to Sarkov, but specifically Nate. So it's like, right. I wasn't expecting him to come back in this fashion. But yeah, he's kind of, it is that situation of he is kind of driven by his instincts, but Tilda kind of didn't really care at this point in time. She wanted whoever this was to kind of suffer for what they did. It's like, because who, Cope David's like, right, we don't know if this person is necessarily driven 100% by instinct, which it seems like it's a combination of two. Yeah, it seems like Nate didn't quite realize what he was doing, but he was, but it's like the animalist that the monster in him. I mean, to be fair, the argument could be is like, well, that's who you've always been. You've always been a monster. It just personified itself and you couldn't control the monster you've always been. You know, you had some monochrome of human decency to keep your monster in check, but your monster was just kind of allowed to run free. It's like that was just you 100% un uninhibited by uh, humanity. You know, that's that's the only difference. But if you once again, it's like he has a monochrome of it holding him back. But it still did, you know, he still like shuts off his humanity a lot when he was dealing with everyone he was experimenting on. And uh, it was only a matter of time because we could see Tilda pushing her powers later in this episode, at one point in this episode, where she's using her power on a flower and it's wilting and dying. And Juan is worried about her because he's worried that she could go down this path of like, because their thing has never been like, they never actively go out of their way to kill someone. It's usually by accident. It's because of the monsters that they are, you know. 
Um, I mean, and there's also a beautiful parallel to like something like Doom Patrol. And once again, it's all about trauma and how that affects you and people, you know, the, the Doom Patrol themselves all look at themselves like monsters and they're like, you know, and that's a back and forth that this trio have about like, right, using the M word and tossing around not only to describe the others, but also themselves. So it's, it's this interesting and complicated conundrum they find themselves in. Um, obviously Abby talks a little bit about her circumstances that obviously since all this started, she hasn't been back home. Obviously, uh, she talked about a, um, her m dad dying. It's like, right. Kind of just like the cruelty of the world. So her making her mom believe like, Oh, I got into Oxnard and, and everything and making sure like, Oh, that's where I am right now. Simply because she doesn't want her mom to wear it. It's like, my mom hasn't really been the same since my dad just like randomly dropped dead of a heart attack. Just kind of like, Oh, like just a healthy person just drops dead from him, you know? And Juan is just talks about his parents' circumstances, you know, a drunk driver type, right? Why is it that the drunk drivers are the one that kind of get away? Like they're the ones that get to walk away unharmed and it's everyone else. And it's a paying the price. So, I don't know if that came up before. Like, we know he's obviously knew that his parents had died, but it, uh, not necessarily know the specifics of it was a drunk driver accident. I don't think that had came up previously. And we actually got a little bit from, um, God, what's his face? Uh, Sarkov in this episode, which he was trying to talk to Tilda about. Once again, whole, his whole thing isn't about making humanity immortal. He's like, that's so like, the fact is, how can you ever get anything done when tomorrow's always coming? In the sense that there's always going to be another tomorrow and another tomorrow. Like, the frivolity of life, the, the finiteness is what makes life all, all the more, all the beautiful. That like, getting stuff done is because you have such a limited amount of time. And cause so much is lost when you have immortality. Like, you, you start, eventually you'll stop, uh, you'll, you'll go through phases of like, oh, I care so much to I care so little. And you know, you could eventually grow so big and everything but his whole point is i just want to give humanity a fighting chance that's all like my research is about because for him he lost everyone he cared about he's like after when i was two i lost everyone i cared about in this world because like how many people have you lost that you've ever really cared about and for Tilda, the only person that's ever come up like that is pj um and it's kind of it's really heartbreaking it's also sad too for her and simon because um she lost pj uh, Rose also died in the car accident. Um, he was the only survivor too, and it just and makes it even harder, especially because like right, if she got fixed, this could have been them back on the road. Especially because how important the band is to her. Her and PJ had just kind of made. Cause I was joking earlier in the episode before obviously he died. I was like, oh man, you guys are like so back and forth. Like you're kind of you're kind of fine one moment, you're kind of not. I, mean, I guess that's young love, and then it's just like right, things never being a hundred percent back to the way they were because he's gone now and. And I thought it was interesting because Juan was like, I know what it's like to lose someone, but you don't want to get consumed by that grief. You got to learn how to forgive because if you don't, it's going to eat you alive. And I think we're definitely going to see that when it comes to Tilda's circumstances over the course of the season, over the rest of the season. But that anger and grief is going to still be consuming her because that's the thing of like, even when you get your revenge, yeah, it feels good probably for a little bit, but eventually that fades and you're left with that anger and sadness, and it's going to come out one way or another, like whether it's at others or whether it's at yourself. So, PJ, they thought he was going to go after um, Abby's family, but it never crossed her mind. Like, right, PJ would realize that Hannah is someone that Abby cares about. So it never crossed her mind because she wasn't sure what their circumstances were. So she thought like, oh, he's going to come after my family, not thinking, oh, he's going to come after uh, Hannah. And because she's immortal, he can kill her as many times as he wants, as he tries to, but he wants to make them pay and make them suffer. And so it's like, right, you give me the cure, which they end up giving him the cure, and it does work, which shows that the cure works. That's fine and dandy. But he ended up um, it's like, right, I won't give you the information until, like, you're further away. And first and foremost, I lo I don't know whether that was a scripted thing or whether that was just, like, unintentional. But uh, Juan backing up and then kind of tripping over the chair. I was like, I can't believe you included that. But I, like, I don't know. If it feels like that was on purpose, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was an accident. And then they just kept it in. Uh, I hope it, I hope it was. I hope it was something uh, completely unintentional. That they're like, no, 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 keep it into the episode. It kind of plays into Juan and kind of being like the dweeb that he is. But um, 
Nate just showing like the nasty side of himself. It's like, right, you did all this and you immediately call up Dr. Crane. It's like, oh my God, I got this for you, the thing you want. And I, I was like, it is, I was like, it seems so unfair for him just to be able to do what he did and walk away. It's like, you brought this upon yourself. You're the one that started all this, you piece of shit. So I was like, I'm glad Tilda melted his brain, literally liquefied. It's like, cool. Uh, you, you're just as urged. You don't get to just walk away after all the death and destruction you've caused. Like, not even just now with Maxwell. I mean, it seems like Maxwell was the first one they killed, so we don't know if they he, they got to anyone else. But if it, even if they, they if they were allowed to continue what they were doing, even if Tilda, Abby, and Juan had walked away, they still would have done this to someone else. And now it's like Nate's come back to cause all this mayhem. And it's like, and he was like, yeah, like, and he, like, even his quote unquote apology wasn't sincere. He's like, yeah, I can really, he's like, I do, I'm starting to regret it now. Like, he didn't sound sincere. He sounded so like, whatever. It's kind of like the thing I need to say. Like, maybe there's some truth to it, but he, it's hard to really believe that while you're also profiting from the benefits of the situation that you were going to give the cure to Dr. Crane and like, oh my God, I was going to make so much money. It's like, yeah. Once again, it's like, they're kind of labeled as the monsters, but you showed yourself to be one long before your transformation. Once again, he kind of got his just dessert, but like I said, I believe it's going to send Tilda down a spiral because revenge doesn't fill that hole anymore. And she's also like done with the... Um, headphones like because it's like right i don't need them anymore she's got better control of her powers and she's embracing it even more because that was actually something sarkov had said that once again it's like she denies what she is that part of herself her powers and everything it's like you keep denying the part of you that's there and this is her kind of embracing it anymore too bad she's kind of embracing it more on the dark side of things rather than the good side of things so we'll see where things kind of go on that front but sadly things between abby and hannah like abby has no hannah has no idea how many times she died because of pj especially because like he stabbed her on like that giant thing and when they you know she's forever going to be trapped with that pain and it's like, right, once the cure is made, you'll be the first one. But for Hannah, it's like, I got to get out of here. It's like, right, you should do the same thing, Abby, before, you know, you get killed in all of this. It's like, I don't know how you're handling all of this. So before anything could even really start, Abby leaves. and I mean, Hannah leaves and it's like, right, maybe next time a monster shows up, kind of give me a heads up. Darcy ends up leaving Juan. So everyone's kind of like, sadly... What makes it easier is having people around you. At least a trio still has themselves, each other. But the problem is, I don't think that uh, it's going to be as well oiled as it was before. Like I think everything that you know, Abby's dealing with, Juan's dealing with, Tilda's dealing with. I think they're not going to be as close as they once were, and they're not going to really have as much have each other like they did before because of all of this. So Nate did a lot of irreparable damage to all of them. So we'll see how things kind of go on that front, but. On the other side of the episode, we have uh, Dr. Crane and the whole Sydney situation. It's like, right, you work on your cure, we'll be able to use your stem cells to uh, fight so many, like, genetic disorders out there in the world. Saying, like, oh, the good will do for it. It's like, well, you're also a large-scale corporation. that even she admits, it's like, yeah, because uh, it's like, oh, what do you think? We waterboard scientists? It's like, well, says the lady who just took a black bag off my head. It's like, you know. So it's like, they're probably they're going to do it for profit, because that's what it always comes down to. And also, like, how you can um, most utilize these sales, and in what fashion. Will it be a situation of selling it to the highest bidder? Of like, yeah, you might be able to solve some genetic stuff, but who's to say you're not going to hike up the price and you know, what you have planned in the long run. Like, you can't trust because humans can't be trusted sometimes. It's a very pessimistic view on things, but it, once again, that, I think that's the point. Like, right, they, our trio and every GP or Jeep gets treated as, oh, you're um, you're the monster, and then humans prove them time and time again how much more monstrous they are than anyone else. So, I also like that whole situation with... Uh, Obviously, every time Sydney's working on her research, on the flip side, whenever she turns into Isabel, Isabel smashes all the sequencers and stuff. But it turns out, like, she was leaving her a message, you know, it's like, oh, say my name, and it's like, oh, whatever with this, like, uh, uh, Beetlejuice bullshit, which I also like. Well, immediately you think Beetlejuice, you also think Candyman, uh, 
But obviously, immediately, like, when she's, when she's got all those say my names, obviously, you can't help but go, you know, you, you can't help but slip into, uh, we have say my name that many times, you can't help but slip into Destiny Shot. It's like, come on, dude. That's a banger. You know, so it's like, you can't help but think that. Wouldn't, wasn't it, uh, oh yeah, it was Candyman, I was about to say, like, speaking of Candyman, because that was what was used for, like, the Candyman, like, reboot slash continuation that Nia DaCosta did, um, with, uh, that's got quite a few people in that movie. Was Tiana Paris in that movie? Because I know Yahya Abdul-Mateen the second was, but I don't remember. I feel like Tiana Paris might have been in that movie, too. Either way, uh, putting tensions and all that aside, uh, I did like that it's kind of like uh, Sydney and her coming face-to-face, -face, and it is that thing of, like, right, her true form is a blank slate. She's kind of like, her subconscious manifests itself in this monstrous form. Because she even said that last episode, and I forgot to talk about it, was she said that... Isabel reminds her so much of her grandmother. It's like, right, I guess kind of give you kind of a familial face to make it a little easier than like what your re what it what it what that side of herself looks like, what it manifests itself as without like, you know, a human disguise. And it's like, oh, I'm not afraid of you. And it's just like bops her on the head. It's like, well, good. And now it's like, oh, they're linked together. It very much like if you've seen The Flash, you know about Caitlin and uh Frost circumstances before they spoiler separated. Which I'm wondering, will that be a possibility? You know, I'm also stupid. Because I, I keep making myth, uh, Misfits references because I just feel so much like Misfits. Because if you don't know, I love Misfits. So it's like getting another show that feels like that is great. Uh, because for one, the Hannah situation reminds me of, spoilers, the Nathan situation. Found himself in a very uncomfortable situation of dying over and over again. And that kind of sucks. Uh, but obviously, uh, Sydney's situation uh, obviously makes me think of Rudy. Um... That's why I'm almost wondering, like, kind of a uh, very Rudy and, uh, Rudy and, uh, Frost situation of they eventually became their own people. Will we see that same thing happen between Sydney and Isabel? Will they always be? Because they are, like, you know, they could still be intertwined, but maybe they will separate kind of more so like Rudy than, more Rudy than frost maybe i don't know that'd be interesting to see but at least right now they're communicating like telepathically like now okay now i don't have to worry about it i'm at your forefront of your mind i'm no longer just in the shadows of your subconscious so now i can reach out to you whenever i need to so but she's saying that sydney's the one destroying everything it's more so like this is what you want i'm just acting upon what you secretly want you don't trust um any of them so it's like, well, what do we do? And it's like, well, you're the boss, uh, Sydney. So it's up to her to kind of determine what's going to happen on that front. So it's going to be interesting to see where uh, things take us there, as well as this whole situation of Sarkov working on the cure. Um, he's just going to have to make more. And obviously they're going to want to take the cure, especially after everything that's going down. I wonder will Tilda have reluctancy to take it now because she has no reason to take it anymore because it's like right it was about pj and the band that's over um juan wanted a normal life again it's like well that kind of abby still has all the reason to because it's like well well juan still does because paloma's birthday uh is coming up and he wants to be chupacabra uh chupacabra free and um Abby wants to be back with her family. So they have every reason to. Tilda kind of doesn't have as much of a reason anymore. So we'll see how things kind of play out from there. But I'm excited to see uh, where the next episode takes us going forward with all of this. But really, that's all I'm going to talk about. Till the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and good